Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you did to set us free in the cross. We who are your people, we know you by your working. We experience you. We, we have life with you day by day by your working. As was prayed already, it is all you that gives us such hope and such blessing, and we say thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, as we turn to the text before us today, that you would give light to it, light that is beyond my ability to clarify and explain that you would give light, Holy Spirit, to the minds of your people here, illumine this passage, illumine your intent in it so that we, your people, can hear it, can see it, can grow, be conformed to you. And Father, I pray also that you would speak to those who may be here or may hear this at some point who are not your people. And I pray that you would cast light in those situations, in those hearts, in those lives also, that you would cast light to save. What's before us today, Lord, is about some big picture, eternally important stuff. Help us to see it. Would you cause us to rejoice in it, to be warned by it, to be corrected by it? Whatever is particularly appropriate, make that so. Lord, it seems to me that there... My voice just changed. (laughs) It seems to me that there is something here also that would call us who are believers, not just to hope, but also to to diligent attention to a, a holy war within, so to speak. If there are people here, myself included, people here among us today who need to be awakened to fight against their sin, make that clear too, Lord. So there are many things here in this passage. Spirit, I am thankful that you are wise and strong. Thankful that you are committed to glorifying the Father, and by his commission you will be at work now. So go and run through the room, please. Father, gain for yourself glory. Lift up Christ in front of our eyes and gain for yourself glory. Build your church, call people to yourself. Make your word clear. We put that out in front of you, knowing that you hear and that you answer, and so we say thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We turn our attention this morning to 2 Samuel chapters 18 and 19. Middle of one and the beginning of the other. When we were last here in 2 Samuel four Sundays ago, it's been a little while now, but we were here four Sundays ago, and we addressed the first half of chapter 18, and its climactic events there. Absalom's rebellion against King David had been our focus for a number of chapters now. We'd, we'd seen that happen, seen it grow and, and be developed. And it seemed that Absalom was riding high. Everything was going his way. He had occupied Jerusalem. He'd chased David and company out. They were on the run in the wilderness again. He'd made several political moves to gather power. Everything was going his way. All of Israel had gathered behind him, and he'd finally mustered a massive army and had marched on David to destroy him and his supporters in battles. But as we saw last time, a month ago, it did not turn out that way. Absalom lost. The battle is mentioned ever so briefly in chapter just three verses. It just says basically they fought and Absalom lost because it wants to leave plenty of space to give to the main issue, Absalom's destruction. He just happened, what do you know, he just happened to come along David's servants. Hung up in a tree by his head, and the royal mount, the donkey, walks off and leaves him hanging there, signifying his kingdom walking away as he's left hung on a tree, cursed. Struck down and killed, 
And then it says, buried in a great pit and covered over with a massive pile of stones, a figurative execution, a stoning, condemning this evil rival king. It was all going just swimmingly until it wasn't. And God cast him down and killed him, cursed and condemned, which of course was not what David wanted. You'll recall David had made a point of telling his army commanders to go easy on the boy, on the young man, Absalom. They're marching out to battle. That was the repeated language of the chapter that we saw. He has a soft spot for his son, even though this son is evil. And he asks them to go easy on him, which, of course, Joab just brushes aside when he kills him. But David was hoping for a different outcome somehow, an impossible, unrealistic one. You think about it, there is no deliverance from evil that does not destroy evil. David hopes for something else and doesn't get it, as we find in this passage today. That's what brings us to our passage, beginning in chapter 18, verse 19, reading through 19, verse 8. I'm going to read through it and then pass, pass back through to touch on some of the details and make sure that we understand the basic flow of the chapter. And I think then as we look at a couple of the, of the issues here, we're going to find something that's encouraging to us. It should be encouraging to you if you're a Christian. But there also might be some challenge. There's something that's, that we're called to in, in this and something we're challenged by perhaps as we see David's response to what the Lord did. So let me read the passage, 2 Samuel 18, beginning in verse 19. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run and carry news of the king that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of his enemies. And Joab said to him, You are not to carry news today. You may carry news another day, but today you shall carry no news, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go, tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed before Joab and ran. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, Come what may, let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, seeing that you have no reward for the news? Come what may, he said, I will run. So he said to him, Run. And then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. Now, David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out and told the king, and the king said, If he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he drew nearer and nearer. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gate and said, See, another man running alone. And the king said, He also brings news. The watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and comes with good news. Then Ahimaaz cried out to the king, All is well. And he bowed before the king with his face to the earth and said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Ahimaaz answered, when Joab sent the king's servant, your servant, I saw a great commotion, but I do not know what it was. And the king said, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. And behold, the Cushite came. And the Cushite said, Good news for my lord the king, for the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all who rose against you. And the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. But the people heard that day, the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. And the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. 
And then Joab came into the house to the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you'd be pleased. Now, therefore, arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and took his seat in the gate, and the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate, and all the people came before the king. It's the word of the Lord in Second Samuel. The passage begins with this Ahimaaz, very eager to run and tell David the news of the military victory, but because he's an Israelite, he's an important figure in in Israel, and because Joab knows that the king's going to ask about Absalom and knows that he might have a negative reaction to that, he says no and chooses a foreigner. Clever Joab. Sends a Cushite, and he takes off with the message, but Ahimaaz is persistent He wants to proclaim this good news. He knows this is a joyous message. And he wants to be the one who gets to shout it out to the city. So he begs him. And finally, Joab relents, probably thinking that the Cushite has a head start and will get there first anyway. So he runs. And meanwhile, David, in a scene reminiscent of something from the very beginning of Samuel, Reminiscent of Eli sitting in the gate waiting to hear news of a battle involving his sons. He sits waiting to hear. Waiting to hear what other people report to him, the watchman from up above. And he hears of messengers running, surely carrying news and likely good news given who it seems to be. And Ahimaaz gets there first and is able to scoop the story. All is well, literally he says, Shalom. Which doesn't just mean peace from war, and there's no more fighting, but means good, rest, contentment, wholeness, all is well. But what does that mean? Well, to Ahimaaz and to everybody else, what that means is verse 28, all is well, blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the King. That's the news, and that's the good news that he's eager to carry. But that's not what David wants to know. And the king said, is it well with the young man Absalom? There's that strange attitude again, the young man, that's that term that could be translated boy. How's it with my boy Absalom? He's engaged in the most manly of activities here, Absalom is. But he's my boy. How is it with Absalom? And Joab, having told Ahimaaz exactly what happened, he knows that Absalom's dead, but he also is sensing the odd atmosphere here. He kind of hedges. Well, you know, there was a lot going on. I'm not completely sure what happened. And thankfully, then the foreigner arrives. (laughs) So he steps to the side, and the Cushite comes. Good news for my lord the king. The Lord has delivered you. And again, that's still not what David wants to know. Same question as before. Is it well with the boy Absalom? Is he okay? Perhaps a little more insensibly, the Cushite says, Is he okay? Are you out of your mind? May all of the king's enemies and all who raise their hand against you to do evil be like that young man, cursed, condemned, and dead. Thank God. He just lays it right there in front of him. Is he okay? Blessed be the Lord. No, he's not okay. He's under a pile of stones in a hole. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And David comes undone. He falls into deep mourning for Absalom. And though he retires to his room, it's right above the gate, notice. And so as all the army comes back into the city, they're passing right underneath where the king is weeping and weeping and weeping. My boy, my boy, my son, my son, my son, my son. Eight times. 
my son, my son, my son. And they all hear about it, and Joab hears about it, and their victory that day, verse 2 of chapter 19, was turned into mourning. The king is grieving for his son, and so they slink back into the city ashamed of what they've done on the battlefield. Used by the Lord to deliver the king and the kingdom, they are now covered over in Joab's words, covered in shame. And Joab has words with David. This is a remarkable, blunt, and heavy speech. He essentially grabs him and shakes him. You are about to lose the kingdom anyway. Because you've just made crystal clear to all of us that you would rather we all be dead and that evil man, Absalom, who killed your other son, remember that? And who wants to kill you and all of these sons and daughters and wives and concubines. Not to mention what he did with the concubines back in Jerusalem. That you value him more than everything that the Lord has done today through the servants of the Lord who were loyal to you and risked everything on the battlefield for you. This needs to change right now. David snaps out of it and comes back down and sits in the gate in the place where the judge, where the king would sit and all the army is welcomed to him and he then greets them and presumably thanks them. That's the passage. A story that shows us a remarkably joyous event brought crashing down by David's response. I can make a couple of observations about it, but let me summarize it with this statement. What we need to see here and, and learn from this, put it in one sentence, God's good deliverance includes the good destruction of all that is evil. God's good deliverance is real. It is coming. It is good. It is deliverance. And that good deliverance of the Lord includes the good destruction of all that is evil. That too is coming. That too is real, and that too is good. I'm going to break that in half, essentially make two observations. Here's the first point. Concerned with the happy message carried by the runners. Good news. The Lord delivers his king and kingdom to peace. Take this and may it sit on you. Something you probably intellectually already are familiar with, but it, let it be pronounced to you. Good news. The Lord delivers his king and kingdom to peace. That's the message that the messenger is so eager to carry. Ahimaaz wants to tell David, verse 19, let me run and carry news. That's the word repeated a bunch of times throughout this passage. I want to proclaim this news. To those who are back there waiting and uncertain, the Lord delivers. When he finally comes to David, verse 28, all is well. Shalom. Peace. God has delivered you from your enemies to peace. And the Cushite, same thing, verse 31, good news, my Lord, the Lord has delivered my Lord this day from the hand of all who rose against you. You are delivered. That's the message. Several times throughout this passage that they want to proclaim, that they're eager to proclaim. The news, blessed be the Lord, because he has delivered the king and the kingdom. From evil to peace. That's the message. That's what the Lord has done. The Lord delivered. Now, obviously, verse 5, Joab points out that it's the servants, the soldiers who this day saved your life and the lives of all your sons and daughters. 
As we've seen again and again, the Lord providentially works through people. He used the army. He used the commanders. Absolutely. But it was the Lord who did it. It was the Lord's power who made this so. God saved David. God delivered him. God secured his kingdom in the state of peace. And everyone is delighted to announce that. Delighted in a worshipful sense. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has done something marvelous for us this day. News. Think about why this is such good news. There are obviously some tangible, concrete reasons. It has saved the lives of your sons and your daughters and your wives, your concubines, and all of the faithful servants here that, are, that have cast in their lot with you. It has saved their lives physically. Of course, that's good. If Absalom wins, he kills them all. So there's that. But beyond, beyond that, the, the obvious, tangible, physical things. Beyond that, you have to see what's going on as these two kingdoms are in contention. The kingdom of Absalom and the kingdom of David. Absalom as king, David as king. That's not just like the Republicans and the Democrats. That's not just like two people running for president. This guy may win or this guy may win. It's not that. And it's not just something so simple as, as uh, this human power, let's say communism or, or a particular government, the Nazis, versus over here democracy or, or the allies, the Americans, the Brits. It's, it's not something human. David and David's kingdom is the chosen kingdom of God on earth. David is the Lord's anointed servant. To oppose him is not to pick a different political flavor of the day. To oppose David and David's kingdom is to oppose God and God's kingdom. It is to oppose righteousness and justice. It is to oppose all that is good, all that is holy, and all that is pure. There, there is, a, there is a, the starkest of all possible lines here between Absalom and his kingdom and David and his kingdom. And the outcome of that uh, on the earth, the outcome of it would be tragic if Absalom were to win. God's word would be broken if Absalom were to win. God's kingdom would perish on the earth if Absalom were to win. God's promise to raise up after David, not Absalom, but Solomon, and down through Solomon's line to bring a Messiah, would perish if Absalom is to win and wipe out David's house. We see just one little battle here, but what this is presenting before us is is the battle of the ages. The kingdom of God And the other kingdom, the kingdom of the rival king. You, if you're like me, you probably do not sufficiently understand how wonderful it is that the kingdom of God Wins here, wins here. People, think for a second. There is a, there is a king who himself is the embodiment of all that is beautiful and right. And God has delivered him and his reign 
into your life and will surely deliver him and his reign into all of the earth, covering it like the waters cover the sea. And that is precious beyond all imagination. But it is very hard for us to take that in and actually think like that. Because it is so familiar to us. And because rarely does the kingdom of evil rise up and show itself. I, I feel, as I'm preparing the sermon and even as I'm standing here preaching it, I feel a lack of, of ability to verbally express evil. I can only say an English word. And I know that if I begin to illustrate evil, the first thing that pops into my mind, probably the first thing that pops into your mind, are things of, of atrocity type stuff, like you know, child abuse, mass murder. I'm talking about evil. Get this. Honor your father and mother. No. Evil. Do not bear false witness, which means don't deceive, always tell the truth. No, that's evil. Do not covet. Evil. I say that, and I think probably most of us say, what, what? What? That's sin. I get that. It's, it's the Ten Commandments, if there's a couple of them, but evil? Yes. All who raise their hand against the Lord and against His anointed, all that raises their hand against God, against His throne, that would say to Him, You shall not reign. Whatever you say is at best advice, I will choose. That is evil. And if that were to triumph in your heart and in our community and across the earth, oh! And I'm not even, here's where my language lacks me again, I'm not even talking about, boy, society would just go into the, into the tank. That's true. I'm not talking about that. Society going into the tank, yes, oh, terrible. But worse, the Holy One who made everything, who made you, who made you to know Him, who means to communicate all goodness, would be denigrated and shut down and said no to and rejected. That is evil. Tragedy. And yeah, society falls apart too. I say this, I can't even communicate it. That is evil. That is awful. And one embodying that, Absalom raised up his hand against the Lord and against his anointed, and God said, no. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because that no is not locked into 1000 BC in a moment on a particular battlefield. That no is locked into God's plan of the Davidic line ending in the Messiah, the King. And he has said, no, I will not allow him to be overthrown, but I will in fact deliver him and his kingdom. Glory, good news for you. Good news for you. Good news for you. Good news. God the Father is radically, passionately, emphatically committed to casting down evil and lifting up all that is good, His Son and His kingdom. Good news for you. Because that King and that kingdom is good. Not just because that will make society work out better. That's tr crystal clear true also. That'll make all of your relationships and everything else work out just so much better. 
Because that's how God made the world. There's a, there's a connection between real life and this union with God, this beholding of God, this following after God, this submitting to the reign of God. There's, there's a real connection. But that is secondary of primary importance. Is God central to your eyes and heart? And he has said, I will deliver him and enthrone him and secure his reign over you. That is good news. The best of all possible news for you. We read this passage and we as outsiders look at it and we don't have any kind of the sense of of delight and excitement in it that the messengers do because they're announcing news that we already know. We're just reading a story that happened several thousand years ago and in fact, if you flip back, we already knew it was going to happen. We saw it happen in the previous chapter. God told us it was going to happen in the chapter before that. Chapter 17. I'm going to bring harm upon Absalom. So there's no news here for us. We read it and see their extreme excitement about it, but we just kind of read it. That's okay. We're just reading a book here. But men and women, the great problem is I can talk, I can attempt to preach like I just was, and it still can fall on us. Eh, that's interesting. This, if, if, you, if you would grab this, if this would grab you, if you would grab this, you'd move through life differently. Let me pick just an example. We have all read the newspapers recently and had to face, or for those of our parents, had to explain to our kids how judges and courts can decide that it's just fine for people of all sorts of flavors and varieties to marry whoever, however many, whenever they want. We've had to face that, and those of us who are parents had to explain what all those pictures in the paper are. Why that guy is kissing that guy. What those headlines mean. And we know God made marriage to reflect into the world what Christ united with the church is supposed to look like. This is marriage is, is a universally created model. Not just Christians, everybody gets married. And God created marriage to reflect something critical about Christ and the church. So, so we, we look at that and we think marriage, what's going on in marriage is actually very close to the gospel. Marriage is very important. And some guy somewhere just changed it all. What's going to happen? to this tremendously important model that God created and pressed into the world to explain what the gospel is like to people. It's just been destroyed. It's been ruined. What's going to happen? And watch, watch, watch us. Maybe watch yourself. We get it all kind of tied in knots as this stuff is happening. Anxious and angry. Infuriated and worried. What's going to happen? What kind of world are we going to grow up in? What are my kids going to believe? What are they going to think about this? What's going to happen to to God's attempt to express the gospel? It's going to be at least curtailed in some way. Oh no, oh no, oh no. That, I don't know if that's your reaction, but my, oh my, that's a Christian reaction right now. Yeah, I understand clearly. I think from what I've already said, it should be clear that I believe that God clearly teaches in the Bible marriage between one man and one woman. Okay, so I'm not advocating some alternative arrangement there. Big deal. 
big deal. Why can I say that? Good news. God has delivered his king and his kingdom. No judge and no court is going to change that. That's one little example, but you can find plenty of others in your life where what piles in on you as you see Absalom, figuratively speaking, Absalom's army marching and Absalom ascendant and this other kingdom chasing the kingdom of God out into the wilderness. You see that happening in your life, in, in your family, in the society around us, and it feels like we are going to be overwhelmed. The church is going to be overrun. The gospel is going to be undercut. What a what a what a what is going to happen? Good news. What, oh, what, oh, what is going to happen? This. The king enthroned and the kingdom spread over the earth as the water covers the sea is going to happen because God is emphatically, emphatically committed to his glory covering the earth in his king for your good. So why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. You shall yet again praise him, your God and your salvation, your God, your deliverer. Our response in this world, in the midst of the other kingdom still ascendant, is to, is to realize the Lord has delivered his king from the cross and from the grave and will ultimately finally deliver him from everything and from every rival, everywhere, forever. That's good news. It's real, it's coming, the deliverance of God, and it's coming in a particular way Second observation is maybe a challenging one. We'll have to think about it carefully so we don't misunderstand a couple things here. Don't, don't come off with a, a bad attitude about this. <coughs> but here's the second point. Good news. The Lord delivers up to destruction the enemies of his king. So the first point, good news, the Lord has delivered his king and his kingdom to peace. And the second one, good news, he delivers up to destruction the enemies of his king. Or to put it another way, the Lord's deliverance to peace involves the destruction of all evil. And that's good news even where it might be painful. So we see the Lord delivering here. That's, that's what we've already looked at. Verse 28, the Lord has delivered up the men who rebelled. That's not delivering. That's delivering up. That's destruction, judgment, condemnation. Verse 32, then from the Cushite, may the enemies of my Lord the King and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man that is condemned and destroyed. The delivering of David and the securing of his kingdom reign is accomplished in the delivering up of his enemies. This is what happens, and it's exactly what David had hoped to avoid. When he told his commanders, go easy on him. Odd lays are marching out to battle. And it's what he really wants to know when the messengers come, good news, the Lord has delivered you. Yeah, 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 yeah. What about Absalom? Is he okay? That's what he really wants to know. When the Christianite tells him plainly, he's overwhelmed, he's weeping, such is his concern for Absalom. And here's the hard part, such is his misplaced concern for Absalom. Now, should he grieve for his son, Yes. The Bible tells us very clearly that, that God himself takes no delight in the death of the wicked. 
You hear even in that sentence, he calls them the wicked. There's no equivocating on that. But he takes no delight in it. So God himself judges in tears, if you will. So is it appropriate for David to be at all remotely grieved? Of course it is appropriate. But this goes far beyond what is appropriate. And the text makes it very clear. It it makes it so that we cannot miss the inappropriateness of this. Very end of chapter 18, five times he's weeping, my son, my son, my son, five times. And then verse 4, chapter 19, three more times. Eight times, my son, my son. What's David concerned about? My son, 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 my son. And in the middle, sandwiched between that, is Joab and the army coming back and saying, oh man, I feel like garbage. Here's our victory, the Lord's deliverance turned into shame and they slink back into the city. Stole into the city as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. That's not what they did, actually. They fought valiantly, bravely, trusted the Lord and delivered him, but they feel like they've done something wrong. And that's what Joab says also, verse 5, you've covered them in shame. David's reaction is wrong. And his grief there reveals something to us. What he most wants right now, David, what David most wants right now in this situation, his top concern, is that the one he cherishes not be destroyed. Defeated? Sure. David did muster an army. He wants to fight and win. Defeated? He wants Absalom to be defeated. He wants Absalom to be put back into his place, but not destroyed. I don't want that. I care about him too much. That's the problem. Here's a person set before us, heart laid open in front of us, and we see what he values. I, I, yeah, yes, I do want evil to be put down, but not really totally, completely eliminated. Just kind of like reordered. I do want this kingdom lifted up, but not, but not in totality. I want a partial deliverance. I want, I want a compromised Reordering of things. One, one commentator describing this said, this, this is like a man going in to get a cancer tumor removed who only wants half of it taken out because actually, you know, it's part of me. Stupid. Those are my cells, and you know, I'm attached to them, so leave some. That's David's approach here. I really want, my heart gives me away, what I really want is Absalom. Who, that, the evil, wicked Absalom? Yeah. What? That's, that's the point that may challenge us here this morning because it is not hard for us to think about, amen, The kingdom of God will be lifted up. The kingdom of Jesus will be lifted up. And all that is evil will be destroyed. The evil stuff that I hate will be destroyed. That's not hard. It's the evil stuff that I have some affinity for being destroyed. That's hard. So we need to think very clearly about this and soberly about it. There is no compromise. There is no live and let live detente between these two kingdoms. It is a fight to the death. The book ends with another great battle with a king who destroys not just the evil king, but all of the human beings who are on his side. We need to think carefully about this. 
Because if that were to happen today, there are people that we know, relatives of ours, friends of ours, neighbors of ours, that would be in that army, destroyed. They run through your mind perhaps right now. You know their names. Should there be grief in you as you think that through? Yes. Yes. There is, there is a real grief in the heart of God as he judges. There should be grief. But check yourself. It is one or the other. One kingdom or the other. Resolve the tension by speaking to those beloved ones and pleading with them to flee from the wrath to come. Do not deny the coming of the wrath. Pray for them. Prayer matters and prayer works. Pray for them and ask God to have mercy on them now and to destroy in them the kingdom that currently holds them rather than to wait and destroy them. So you plead with God and you plead for people to flee from the wrath and to call people to salvation, but do not deny the wrath. I interact often with both non-Christians and alleged Christians who deny the wrath. At least the wrath on this loved one. Don't go that way. Instead, plead with tears and call them to faith. Plead with those you love to flee from the wrath to come. There's an, another way that I think that we should approach this. Because the attitude here, so I, I'm leaving aside other people for a moment, and I'm, I'm trying to grab a hold of the attitude that's the problem in David. The, the attitude of there's something that opposes the reign of God that I love and I want to hold on to. I will not make total war on it. That's, that's the attitude. You see what I'm doing there? Taking that attitude and I'm saying, God is opposed to whatever would tear down the reign of this king. Out there, watch this, in here. So we who are Christians, the first thing what I was just talking about that we need to think very carefully, very soberly, and it should drive us to pray and to preach. We need to think very carefully about God and setting up his kingdom and fighting and making war to destroy all out there that opposes him. But we also need to realize that he is also concerned to destroy everything in the heart of a Christian that opposes him. So the last thing I put before you is a question. Are you... As committed, are you as committed as the Lord is to opposing what's in you that resists his reign? Sometimes we Christians speak of holiness, speak of a life pleasing to the Lord and are a long way from making war, are a long way from diligently seeking to put to death all that is in me that is against him. Instead, I seek a compromise. Hebrews would talk about getting rid of the sin and that which so easily entangles. And oftentimes I want to say, I want to like diminish the sin 
and try to untie myself from that which entangles. I just did two things there. You notice that? I don't want to eliminate the sin and the, what entangles. I want to diminish it and get it back in its proper place. There is no live and let live attitude between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the other king. He wants all of your heart. All of your heart. So what do you say? Are you giving him a good solid 85%? The wrong way to respond to this would be to say, I'm going to suck it up and do it. Or, boy, I sure hope God changes me. What's for lunch? Those are the two wrong ways to respond to this. Sanctification works. Taking those, the best of those two extremes, sanctification works When I pray, 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 oh God, work out of me what is displeasing to you. Work out of me all the tentacles of the other kingdom that have wrapped around my soul and choke out your kingdom. I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done in here as it is in heaven. Please hallow your name in here. Please deliver me from the evil one as he attacks me in here. You pray, pray, pray for God to move and then you fight, fight, fight and say no to sin with the power that God provides. And he will provide it as you resist the devil. This is how the New Testament talks about the fight for holiness all the time. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Who works? Both you and God. Are you at war in yourself, and I mean that in the best possible way. I don't mean in turmoil and and morose. I mean, are you eager to find to find out what it is to have the king reign over you? Christian, there's a sweetness in that. Fight for it. Pray for it. Fight for it. God has delivered his king and his kingdom to peace. And how he does that in us often involves a stirring in you to want holiness, to cry out to him for his power, and to diligently fight against your sin when you see it. He means to destroy that kingdom in you, not make peace with it. So perhaps now you need to pray to God. Perhaps you need to ask Him, Lord, what kind of work do you want to do in me? Pray. Repent if you need to. Take a few minutes here and then we'll, we'll close with a response. But, but I mean pray. Now, I, I don't mean pack up your Bible and get ready to go. I mean pray now. And then we'll close.